Welcome to the lecture on chapter 12, where we're going to talk about galaxy distances and Hubble's law. In other words, we're going to talk about the many galaxies that populate the universe and how we know how far apart those galaxies are from each other and from our home galaxy. This is building on the discussion that we had last week on talking about our home galaxy and what a galaxy is, how galaxies were discovered, how it was discovered that we weren't the only galaxy in the universe, and so on. Okay, so let's just expand on those ideas as we discuss galactic distances. All right, so in our first section here, we have goals of understanding how do we measure the distances to galaxies? How did Hubble, right, important astronomer, prove that galaxies lie far beyond the Milky Way? And what is Hubble's law? All right, so measuring distances to galaxies is a multi-step process. We talked a little bit about how to measure distances when we talked about stellar distances and kind of understanding the idea of Cepheid variables as a as, a, as a, a phenomenon that has a fixed luminosity, and therefore astronomers can look at that flashing star, look at the rate at which it's flashing, know what kind of type, type of star that is, and then measure its apparent brightness, the amount of light that reaches us here on Earth, and thus calculate its distance. So that's definitely part of the story of measuring distances. In fact, the whole story involves going from radar to parallax to those variable stars called Cepheid variables, and then finally looking at white dwarf supernovas as the most common type of what's called a distant standard because the white, no white, white dwarf supernovas always release the same amount of energy. So again, the relative brightness measured here on Earth tells us how far away that supernova was from Earth when it occurred. All right. And a quick reminder, parallax is the idea of the actual motion of the stars, uh, nearby stars in the sky relative to more distant stars in the background. And the idea there is that because Earth orbits the sun and thus has a circular orbit almost of about 150 million kilometers, well then that's, that means as we move side to side relative to other stars, those stars must move back and forth a little bit. It turns out that the actual parallax angle is about one arc second, slightly less than one arc second. That's the maximum movement of any star. That's the closest, closest neighbor. Okay, So they're very small movements, but of course we can measure very, very small movements with accurate telescopes. Okay. So let's uh, summarize some of this information. Again, it's good, it's good to review it here. All right, so um, considering the idea of light intensity and why things that are further away are dimmer, I mean, I certainly think that's common sense. But here we can uh, consider an analogy of street lamps. So, um, so if we think of them as what's called a standard candle, and again, that's the terminology astronomers use for those variable stars and white dwarf supernovas. Collectively, they're known as standard candles because they have a known brightness, okay? Well, known luminosity, amount of wattage that they put off. All right. They, so all, in this case, all the street lamps would have the same luminosity because they're a standard. Okay. And so the nearest one appears bright. One that's further away appears less bright. And one that's further away still appears even less bright. And that's because the distance, how far away they are, in this case, twice as far, means that it's one quarter as bright. And one that's three times as far would be one ninth as bright because the relationship is a square root relationship. Okay. So we say that brightness is proportional to one over the square of distance. It's an inverse square law is the term there. There are lots of examples of these inverse square laws and things that get less intensive distance, brightness being one of them. All right, so let's go through those measuring those distances. Step one, determine the size of the solar system using radar. Okay, so this would be important for knowing exactly how large Earth's orbit is around the sun because we need to know that to get accurate measurements of parallax, all right? Step two, determine the distance of stars out to a few hundred light years using parallax. And this would be kind of, you know, measuring the relative location of a nearby star to the distant star background, which is approximately fixed in, say, the month of January, making that same measurement again in the month of July, having a distance here um, that is about 3 times 10 to the 9 um, kilometers, and then noticing that the star has moved a certain amount. This would be the nearby star. See how it is shifted relative to the background stars, and then measuring that angle there as the angle of parallax. Okay, and then that then we have a formula that tells you exactly how far away a star is based on that angle. It turns out that one arc second of that angle, so that's theta being one arc second, and one arc second is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. All right. 
So it's a very small fraction of a degree. And that 3600 comes from the fact that there's 60 arc minutes in a degree and there's 60 arc seconds in every arc minute and 60 times 60 is 3600. And so if we think then, what, what does this tell us for distance? Well, it tells us a star that has one arc second of movement is one parsec away, all right? And one parsec in distance is about 3.4 um, light years, okay? So it's just, just over three or well, almost three and a half light years away, okay? And then you might be, well, how far is a light year? Well, a light year is about nine trillion kilometers, okay? All right, so luminosity passes through each sphere. Um, in, uh, well, luminosity passing through each sphere, sphere is the same, and the area of the sphere is four pi r squared. So we divide luminosity by area to get brightness. Okay, so this this is the the exact formula for finding out what what is the relative brightness. Okay, so we divide luminosity by area to get brightness. So what that would look like is brightness, and that's what we measure on Earth. Okay is then going to be the actual luminosity, which is watts, okay? So that's watts of luminosity, that's just energy per time, all right? So energy per time is watts, is luminosity. I know it's lots of names for the same thing. You can call it energy per time, you can call it watts, you can call it luminosity, where's luminosity, right? Watts, but it's just, it's power, right? So there's another name for it. But uh, astro astronomers do tend to call it luminosity, but it ultimately has units of joules per second or energy per time, okay? But then ultimately, since they have this, this sphere over which the energy is covering itself, and well, the energy is covering that sphere, then we would divide by the area, which is then four pi r squared, okay? So there's the inverse distance relationship that I showed you before, the one over d squared, okay? But here specifically, we're, saying, we're seeing that there's also a four pi because that's the surface area of the sphere. All right, so the relationship between apparent brightness and luminosity depends on the distance. Here's the formula that I just showed you on the previous page. So then if you wanna solve for distance, because often that's the unknown, then you have to algebraically re rearrange this and you end up with this formula here. And all we've done here is cross multiply by distance and taken the square root of both sides, okay? We've also cross divided by brightness, okay? And brightness is something that we measure on Earth. Okay, so you measure brightness, you compare it to other things. Um, brightness is, is measured based on a logarithmic scale, known, um, comparing to other things of known luminosity, like the sun being a really important one. Okay, so a standard candle is an object whose luminosity we can determine without measuring its distance. Okay, that means we know exactly how far away it is just based on its other behavior, like the, the flashing rate of the star or the, the fact that there is a white dwarf supernova and they all release the same amount of energy. So that's great because then anything nearby that standard candle, we also know how far away it is. It's not great for everything that's in between the standard candles because then we have to kind of guess and figure out, but it's, you know, it's at least means that everything that's nearby a standard candle, we know how far away it is, all right? So which kind of stars are best for measuring large distances? High luminosity stars or low luminosity stars? I bet you can guess high luminosity stars because the light travels much further, okay? The low luminosity stars may become effectively invisible to all but the most sensitive sensors if they're too far away. Okay, so Cepheid variables. We've mentioned these before on the HR diagram, but here they are. Okay, Cepheid variables, they're dying stars. They're red giants, okay? And they're, they're a particular type of red giant that in its, in its phase of kind of, you know, figuring out what elements are going to be fusing in the core and, and having a, a, a somewhat unstable thermostat due to um, unstable rates of nuclear fusion and gravitational contraction. Well, these types of stars, they pulsate. And as they pulsate, they get brighter and dimmer, brighter and dimmer. And the rate at which they do it is usually, usually a couple times per day. So they have this, this like kind of this, you know, this pulse that maybe, you know, lasts, you know, like two pulses per day or two pulses per week, but, you know, in that range. And there's a direct relationship then between that pulse rate and the luminosity of the star, the true wattage, the output, okay? So it's a really important group of stars, and, we, and astronomers have just kind of discovered them. They stumbled across them. The name, in fact, the fact that they're called Cepheid variables refers to the constellation where they're first discovered, and astronomers did not realize initially what they, what, how that relationship worked. It was just over subsequent studies and just kind of exploring the data that the truth became, um, you know, revealed, okay? So because the period of Cepheid variable stars tells us their true luminosity, we can then measure them as, or we can treat them as standard candles. Here's that relationship. Okay, so here is the luminosity measured in, in uh, luminosities of the sun. They're all much, much more luminous than the sun because there are red giants, so they're putting off a lot of energy. And here is the period, um, which is the, you know, how long it takes for them to go through a full pulse of bright, dim, back to bright. 
And so you can see that the, um, the ones that pulse the fastest are pulsing um, you know, once every three days, so about twice per week. So I guess there's none that pulse twice per day. So twice per week is about the fastest rate. And then as they get slower, they, they might only pulse you know, once per every 30 days or even once per every 100 days. But there's a nice linear relationship between the, you know, between the period of pulses and the luminosity, which means then we can really just measure the period of pulses and then calculate the true luminosity. See, it's a real, real nice relationship there. Okay, is it perfect? No, but it's a pretty, pretty good relationship, pretty linear. So Cepheid variable stars with longer periods have greater luminosities. All right, see, because see, that, see how that that big number corresponds to the greater luminosities. Okay, and that's the true luminosity. Um, white dwarf supernovas, those are the other ones we mentioned. Those are the other standard candles again. Okay, so the two types of standard candles, what are they? They are Cepheid variables and white dwarf supernovas. Those are it, okay? And so white dwarf supernovas are very, very bright. Here it is at near peak brightness. And they can be used as standard candles. They're, they're helpful as standard candles basically in other galaxies because they they work you know they work fine in our, our galaxy too but there's they're not that common right only so many supernovas occur in a certain amount of time right now if you consider the hundred hundred billion galaxies or so then there's basically probably going to be one occurring just about at any time we just have to be happen to be looking at it um, their their peak brightness um, you know doesn't last that long but when it's happening it has a characteristic shape and a characteristic peak luminosity which is very reliable. And that really has to do with the fact that the white dwarf supernovas, unlike other types of supernovas, always follow the same setup. It's the same series of events that leads to them. So they're all gonna have very, very matching conditions that lead up to the explosion of the star. And I say this in comparison to massive star supernovas because massive star supernovas, there's, they can, you know, first of all, there's two byproducts that become black holes or, or white or neutron stars. And in the, there's, there can be very different element compositions leading up to that explosion. You know, it's, there's a lot, a lot of factors that are gonna make them very, very variable, right? And, but not variable in the sense of you know, pulsating like the Cepheid variables, but just so that they, they don't all produce the same, amount of, the same amount of energy. But white dwarf supernovas, they only occur when they're, and they're in a binary star system. And that's because it, they, they need a other star to pull matter off of. If you recall, the whole idea behind the white dwarf supernova is a, a white dwarf is in a binary star system because of its high density and high gravitational pull, it is, it is pulling matter off the other star. That matter is swirling around the white dwarf. That accretion disk itself can undergo um, uh, basically hydrogen fusion that can release a nova, a huge burst of energy. But while that's happening, there's also matter that's accreting onto the surface of the white dwarf itself. Eventually, there's so much mass that builds up on the surface of the white dwarf, it overcomes what's called the Chandrasekhar limit, which basically tells us that white dwarfs can never be one, never greater than 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Because when they do, that, that means that the gravitational strength is so great that it actually overcomes the electron degeneracy pressure, which was the only thing that was holding the white dwarf together and keeping it from collapsing under the force of gravity. So once that, that force is overcome, the white dwarf starts to collapse. It doesn't collapse into a black hole. Instead, it, as it collapses, it condenses matter. That energy has to go somewhere, and that energy bursts out, and there's a huge explosion, the white dwarf supernova. Okay? All right. Step four. Moving on. So the apparent brightness of a white dwarf supernova tells us the distance to galaxies up to 10 billion light years away. So this is a standard candle with almost no limit. Because the furthest we can look is about 13 billion. So we're looking almost to the very edge of the seeable universe. All right, but now Hubble's gonna come in, okay? So up to this point, we've got standard candles, that's it, okay? That's great, let's just measure distances. Let's just measure distances even outside of our own galaxy. Now we can, I know we're kind of taking it as gospel that there are other galaxies. And we've discussed that a little bit, right? That we're in a galaxy, there's other galaxies, but we'll talk about that more, okay? But now we wanna introduce this idea of Hubble. How did Hubble prove that galaxies lie far beyond the Milky Way? Because for a long time, they were, they were called spiral nebula. Because with good telescopes of the early 20th century, we're talking 1920s, okay? Well, that in that time frame, they, they could be seen as having a spiral shape. They were very dim, so they were thought to be maybe, you know, just kind of not very active new, um, nebula of some sort. Not, astronomers weren't sure what they were. They were quite common. But no one really necessarily thought that they were outside of our own group, right? At this point, astronomers definitely realized we were part of a big swirling mass. The idea of the Milky Way, the idea of the galaxy had been shown, you know, that there was a collection of stars that we were part of. It was all moving. But the question was, was that the entire universe? You know, that's, maybe it was. They, that idea that these spiral nebulae themselves could be 
other masses of stars with as many stars as we were beginning to calculate in our own Milky Way, that was a pretty revolutionary idea. Because that means you're going from having, you know, maybe an estimate of 50 billion stars, if we're considering in the 1920s, they didn't realize that our galaxy had 100 billion, or maybe they just thought it was 100 million for that matter. But, you know, you have some estimate of a massive number of stars, which makes it the universe. We call it the Milky Way, we call it what we want, but that's our known universe. Then we have these other nebula, if we consider that each of them have, each of those nebula have as many stars as our own swirling mass of stars, our own galaxy, then that means that the universe is much, much bigger than we were thinking it was at this time, okay? That's definitely a revolutionary idea, okay? So before Hubble, some scientists argued that the spiral nebula, right, now what we know, now know as galaxies, were entire galaxies like our Milky Way, while others maintain that they were smaller collection of stars within the Milky Way, okay? Right? I mean, that's common sense probably tells you that they must be within it. I mean, like, seems so outlandish to think that there are other galaxies. The, um, the debate remained unsettled until Edwin Hubble finally measured their distances, okay? Because that's what you need, okay? So Hubble settled the debate by measuring the distances to the Andromeda galaxy using Cepheid variables as standard candles, okay? So at the, the idea of using white dwarfs as standard candles was not really well known in the 1920s. The idea of using Cepheid variables had really just taken off. It had been, it, they, their idea, their direct relationship to luminosity, like the graph we saw before, and the, their pulse rate are, are measured in days um, as you know, being, the, being the function that drives um, their luminosity, that had just kind of started to been, be understood um, by a group of uh, mostly women astronomers that had really mapped out all of, all of that data. So it was, it was kind of, you know, hot science of the time and uh, Hubble applied it with just the right telescope under just the right conditions to that particular spiral galaxy. And he chose well because the Andromeda galaxy is the closest galaxy. So it was, it, at the time, it really would have wanted, wanted, bid one of the few galaxies where you could actually make out an individual Cepheid variable because it's hard to make out one star, even a fairly big, bright red dwarf, you know, or sorry, red giant star like that. Because, I mean, there's 100 billion stars in the Andromeda galaxy. Making out one single flashing one, that's, that's, a, that's a hard thing to, to find, right? But the idea is that they are fairly bright, and you know, Hubble was able to find one and measure its pulse rate and calculate how far away the Andromeda galaxy was, okay? And he was then able to say that, that, nope, this is not within our Milky Way. It's way too far. Because he found the distance to be about 2 million light years away. And no one thought, there was no expectation that our own galaxy was 2 million light years across. So that was way too big. That means there had to be a, a big gap of empty space between us and this other galaxy. So galaxies were separated by emptiness, essentially. All right? And that, that was Hubble's contribution, a huge contribution to astronomy and science in general. Okay? So that's great to prove there's other galaxies. But Hubble didn't stop there. He continued to take data. Because at this time, other, other people had independently began to be quite confused about these spiral nebula because they had all red shifts, okay? They all had red shifts, which means they were all moving away from us because a red shift is a Doppler effect and it happens when something's moving away. So the idea is that light sources when they move away from an observer become more red. Light sources when they move towards an observer become more blue. But all the spiral nebula that were being cataloged were all had a red shift. Now, interesting, actually, and in contradiction, the, um, at least complicating the matter, is the Andromeda galaxy actually, is actually moving towards us. But Hubble was smart enough to say, okay, well, just because one spiral galaxy is moving towards us doesn't mean they all are. And so when he looked at a much larger selection of them, represented by this first publication in 1929, well, he noticed that, the, in general, most of them are moving away. Okay, and just with a couple of exceptions, and that's because we're crashing into the Andromeda galaxy. The two galaxies are going to fuse in about three and a half million years. Excuse me, billion years. So, um, but the point being that that you know that sure there's that one data point something's happening. But what about galaxies that were further away? So, continuing the technique of using, using Cepheid variables as a standard candle, Hubble and a couple of their astronomers, you know, continued to collect data and find out that these other galaxies were all moving away from us. And again, they were motivated to do that because of other scientists that saw they all had that mysterious redshift. What is going on? All right. So. He then saw that you, finding the distances in millions of parsecs, and remember a parsec is about three light, three light years, three and a half light years, and then so measuring the distances to these distant galaxies in parsecs, and then using their redshift with known emission lines, like the 21 centimeter line from atomic hydrogen, and you know, comparing that to the laboratory, finding out how much that line has shifted using a formula that directly relates velocity and um, that redshift, because that was a known formula and one that had been confirmed independently from astronomy, we could then determine how fast these galaxies were moving away. And there was this nice linear relationship. 
And that's what Hubble's law was. It was this linearity between the velocity of galaxies and how far away they were. In other words, he found that the further galaxies were away, as measured with standard candle methods, the faster they were moving away from us. That's really strange, right? The further galaxies are away from us, the faster they're moving away from us. What does that tell us? What does that even mean? Okay. Well, that, that's what, you know, this is, this is why there's a, a famous telescope named after Hubble, because this changed astronomy. Okay. So the spectral features, features of virtually all galaxies, right, except for the very nearest ones that we're crashing into, are redshifted, okay? Which means that they are all moving away from us. This is the example of a redshift, taking known wavelengths of light and showing that when something's moving away, you know, particular emissions are shifted in the red direction. They're shifted towards longer wavelengths. That's what a redshift means. We call it a redshift if, you, if you're remembering, not remembering why the name is or, or you know, what it means. It's because red light is the longest of the visible light. So if you make something redder, that means you're, you're making the wavelength longer, okay? Now, of course, there's things redder than red, like infrared and radio waves and microwaves, right? But the idea is that within the visible light, moving something towards red is making it a longer wavelength. Thus, it's moving away from you. So by measuring the distances of the galaxies, Hubble found that redshift and distances are related in a special way. That's like that first publication, the, the graph, right? This one here, run the one that made him famous, all right? And so he continued to expand the data. This is a modernized version of a publication from just two years later because he continued to, to collect a lot of data. And this, this graph has been modernized. But the, very, very quickly, he was able to find much more galaxies that were much further away because the first ones are relatively close. But then he started to measure galaxies that were hundreds of millions of light years away. This is also when Hubble started to use other standard candle methods, namely the white dwarf uh, supernova. So, you know, this, the, every, everything's following together, right? The, all the pieces of the puzzle are coming together. And then he found that there was Hubble's constant represented here by uppercase H um, with a subscript of zero, so we call it H naught, and that constant said that the, that the slope of that line is 22 kilometers per second per million light years. Though now, why, why these odd units, basically distance per time per distance? Well, because it's velocity per distance, because the, the velocity, the kilometers per second, is the recession velocity. It's how fast that, that galaxy is recessing from us. Recess, just move away, right? And then, and then since it's dependent on distance, that's why it's velocity per distance is the slope, okay? So that is Hubble's constant, okay? And, you know, that was the time it was quantified, right? Now we actually had a number, and that meant that we actually didn't necessarily have to use standard candles. We could now, since this is a pretty good relationship, right? This, in, in science, we say, okay, well, is this a reliable relationship? Is there a good statistical behavior? And there was. So then scientists started to say, well, okay, then you find a galaxy without a white dwarf supernova and maybe one that's too far away to measure individual Cepheid variable, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, red giant stars, flashing stars inside that galaxy. Well, in that case, just measure how fast the whole galaxy is redshifted. Just look for known emission lines like the atomic hydrogen one. Find out the redshift. Once you know the redshift, you know the velocity. Once you know the velocity, you know the distance. So now we have a way of measuring distance without standard candles. Of course, it was derived from standard candles. It was proved to be accurate with the independently measured standard candles. Two of them in some cases, right? We had galaxies where there are both white dwarf supernovas and Cepheid variables. So we're able to really confirm the idea, make, make sure that it actually makes sense, that it's consistent, that it works, and it did. So now we had Hubble's law, a brand new way of measuring distances, and still a mystery. Why are galaxies that are further away moving away faster? Because it's great, now we can use it, a utility is wonderful, but what about the reason, the big why, all right? So the redshift of galaxies tells us the distance through Hubble's law. So this is how you would actually measure distance using Hubble's law. Think of this as a new method, a new way of measuring distances derived from all the previous ones, built, you know, standing on the shoulders of, of, of all the previous work, going all the way from you know, making radar measurements in our own, our own um, solar system, parallax the nearby stars, within that nearby star range, finding Cepheid variables, then using Cepheid variables outside of our own galaxy, using white dwarf supernova from more distant galaxies, all to lead up to the confirmation that there is one relationship for distant galaxies called Hubble's Law. All right? And the distances of the further galaxies are measured from their redshifts. Because some of them, the ones past 10 billion light years, so those ones, those ones are so far away, the ones that are greater than 10 billion light years, that well, there's no way to measure their distance other than using Hubble's law. There's no, because they can't make out individual, even white or supernova in those distant galaxies. All right, so we measure gal uh, galaxy distances using a chain of in independent techniques, as I was just discussing. Okay, this is a wonderful summary of it. 
in this figure. Everything we've talked about, but I've said it already, so I won't say it again, but again, good, good figure for summary. So in summary, how do we measure the distance of the galaxies? Well, the distance measurement, the measurement chain begins with parallax measurements that build on radar ranging in our solar system. Using parallax and the relationship between luminosity, distance, and brightness, we can calibrate a series of standard candles. What are they? Seven variables and white dwarf supernovas. We can measure greater di uh, distances greater than 10 billion light years using white dwarf supernova as standard candles. Finally, Hubble proved that galaxies lie beyond the Milky Way by measuring the distance, of, the distance to the Andromeda galaxy using seven variable stars as standard candles. And Hubble found and derived Hubble's law that states the faster a galaxy is moving away from us, the greater its distance. Okay, now we've been leaning up to this. I've hinted at it a couple times. What are the implications, the why of Hubble's law? Because that's the amazing thing, right? How, use, find a law, use it, great, okay. But what does it mean? Right, so how does Hubble's law tell us the age of the universe? Whoa, how, how does expansion affect distance measurements? And why does the observable universe have a horizon? Whoa, big questions, okay? So how does Hubble's law tell us the age of the universe? Well, let's look at it. We got our linear relationship here between galaxies. The further they are, the faster they're moving away. Well, let's consider. Your friend leaves your house. She later calls you on her cell phone saying that she's been driving at 60 miles an hour directly away from you the whole time and is now 60 miles away. How long has she been gone? Okay, well, she's been gone for 60 minutes, right? You can, you can work that out, right? Because she's been grinding, driving at a steady rate, right? And you know, she, you know, you know, and she tells you how far away she is, and she's going 60 miles an hour, and she's now 60 miles away. She must have been driving for an hour, okay? If you lost track of time, you'd be able to calculate how far. One hour, 60 minutes, okay? So that same idea applies to astronomy. The expansion rate appears to be the same everywhere in space. The universe has no center and no edge, as far as we can tell. So that means that the universe must be, must be expanding from an original point. And then we can calculate back how long it's been expanding and find out how long ago the galaxy must have been a point. Okay? Because I know that's a big idea, and we'll talk about it more in future chapters. But that's the idea, is that this, the, whole, the whole universe, all of its galaxies... Everything, all the stars in all those galaxies must have started from a single point, okay? So one example of something that expands but has no center or edge is the surface of a balloon, all right? And if you consider an individual point on the surface of the balloon, maybe point B being our perspective, then we can look at other points in the balloon and say, oh, well, this, this one here that is three centimeters away is moving at a rate of one centimeter a second, whereas one that a dot on the balloon that is two centimeters away is moving that is moving, or excuse me, that is six centimeters away, is moving two centimeters per second. It's moving twice as fast because it's twice as far away. And that doesn't mean there's any spe anything special about point B, because we could do the same thing with point C. We could say, oh, well, in that case, point D relative to point C, because it's closer, it would be only moving one centimeter away. But then point A relative to point C would be moving three cent or two centimeters away, right? Because it's twice as far. So that's the idea. That's why further galaxies are moving away fast, faster than us. Not because our galaxy is the center of the universe and everything is racing away from one point. It's just because from the perspective of any point, everything is racing away. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. I know it's a complex idea to think about on first pass, but once it sinks in, it sinks in. All right? So that brings us to a big idea in astronomy called the cosmological principle. And what it says is it says the universe looks about the same no matter where you are within it. So it's, it's basically there, there is no edge. There's no special part of the universe. We can't look you know, in one direction and see you know, the, you know, the universe plane like with a galaxy. No, there's no such thing. Nor can we look in one direction and look towards the beginning of the universe because as we look in all directions, we find galaxies that are equally old in all directions, which is a weird idea, but we'll talk more about that later. So matter is evenly distributed on very large scales in the universe. It has no center or edge. And the cosmolog cosmological principle has not been proven beyond a doubt, but it is consistent with all obser um, ob observations to date. And the one idea, there, is some, there are some good theories that explain why we might have a universe that looks this way. And basically it's due to the fact that, af that shortly after the Big Bang, there was, there was such a huge expansion of the universe so quickly that all the subsequent expansion has been minuscule compared to that original expansion which is called the inflation, by the way, to, I guess, to, to imply that it's something special from the, the subsequent, you know, uh, 15 billion years of more gradual expansion of the universe, okay? So you observe a galaxy moving away from you at 0.1 light years per year, and it is now 1.4 billion light years away from you. How long has it taken to get there? That's a good question, right? It's just like the driver question, isn't it? Well, clearly 14 billion years, okay? So that's the idea. 
That's how we can calculate the age of the universe from Hubble's law. So Hubble's constant tells us the age of the universe because it relates to the velocity and distances of all galaxies. So we simply take distance and we divide by velocity, okay? And when we do that, we just get a one over Hubble's law, okay? So that's a constant, which means the age must be a constant. It means that everything that we're looking at and everything that's moving away from us and the fact that everything is moving away further means that we all must have started at one point. It's almost like if the balloon started as just an individual point. It was, in, it was The balloon was infinitesimally small to begin with. So then all those dots would have been overlaid on top of each other and they wouldn't have become di distinct dots until the balloon started to get inflated, okay? And so that's the idea here is that everything must have stopped, started overlapping on top of each other. So when we look at distant galaxies, we know at some point we must have been one with that distant galaxy. We all had a common origin. So that's why we can calculate the age is just the reciprocal or one over Hubble's constant, okay? And how does expansion affect the distance measurements, okay? Well, the idea then is this. A supernova occurs long ago in a distant galaxy. As time passes, the universe expands. So that's, that's the implication now, that the universe is expanding and it expanded from a single point. We do call that the Big Bang. We'll have plenty of time to talk about the Big Bang in subsequent chapters. As time passes, the universe expands, the distance between the galaxy increases. The galaxy's distance, therefore, is much greater when the supernova light reaches us in the Milky Way galaxy. All right? So the distance has changed dramatically over that time, even since when the light was created. Maybe we were relatively close okay, when the light was created, but we have become much further apart as the light has traveled, okay? So the distances between faraway galaxies change while the light travels. That means that astronomers think in terms of look back time rather than distance. Because when you look back at these distant galaxies, you're actually looking at primordial galaxies, galaxies that, list, that existed in the first billion years of the universe and actually had very different compositions because of the, the kind of the, the production of heavy, heavy elements that has occurred in subsequent generations of stars since then. So you, you're really looking at a, a totally different generation of galaxies because there have been galaxies crashing into each other and forming since then when you look back so far. And you're looking, at, looking back at a very different distance, okay? So, so really, truly, you know, when we talk about, you know, me measuring a galaxy and saying, oh, look, the light, the light from this galaxy tells us that the galaxy is 13 billion light years away. That does not mean that that galaxy is currently 13 billion light years away. In fact, that galaxy might be 26 billion light years away. And so there's this idea that doesn't even get mentioned all that often because people will say, oh, well, you know, the age of the universe is, you know, about 15 billion years. And that means that the, the most distant galaxies are about that far away, 15 billion light years. Okay. Now, of course, you know, years and light years, one is a time, one is a distance, but 15 billion light years is just how far light could travel in that time. But that's the thing is that the, the universe is actually definitely bigger than that. Right now, the estimates are kind of hard to come by, but it's going to be somewhere in the 25 to 30 billion um, um, light years in size because the, the, the universe has expanded so much that that galaxy is now much, much further away. Okay, so expansion stretches the photon wavelengths, causing what's called a cosmological redshift. Now, this is nasty, right? Because we just talked about redshift. We just talked about how, you know, Hubble used redshift as, as really the tool that allowed him to come up with Hubble's law. But now we're talking about a different type of redshift. Well, sorry, but we have to. So here we see a yellow photon of light that is emitted long ago from a distant galaxy. As time passes, the photon stretches along with the expansion of the universe. Now that's a weird idea, I know, but it's true, okay? Because light is part of the universe after all. So if the whole universe is expanding, thus making all galaxies further away from each other, things that are moving in the universe must be expanding too. So the actual photons, the particles of light that we are picking up from those distant galaxies, measuring with our detection devices, they have changed. They have stretched, okay? And since their speed can't change, the only thing that can change is their wavelength because their frequency doesn't change because of conservation of energy, but their wavelength does change. So the light actually becomes redder. Now, here's the thing. So that means that the cosmological redshift is actually compounding the redshift. So distant galaxies are both moving away from us and the light is stretched. So that's making the light further redshifted than it would be otherwise, okay? So why does the observable universe have a horizon? Well, the cosmological horizon marks the limit of the observable universe. It is a horizon in time, because remember, when you look at distant galaxies, you're looking back in time. That's that look back time, rather than space. Since looking far away means looking back in time, there must be a limit, the beginning of the universe. That age, that is equal to one over Hubble's constant. That is as far back in time as you can exist because that's when all the dots on the balloon overlapped. That's when all the galaxies overlapped and were one, okay? They weren't even galaxies. They were just a single point, 
Okay, so how do distance, in summary, how do distance measurements tell us the age of the universe? Measuring a galaxy's distance and speed allows us to figure out how far, how long the galaxy took to reach its current distance. And measuring Hubble's constant tells us the amount of time, about 14 billion years. That's the age of the universe, okay? So um, how does the universe's expansion affect our distance measurements? Well, the look-back time is easier to define than distance for objects whose distances grow while their, height, while their light travels to Earth. Because again, we, it, again, like I said, it's hard to estimate really how far away they are now. It's really, really just your best guess because we're not sure what has happened in that time, right? That galaxy might not even be there anymore. It could have crashed into something else, right? Are there other phenomena that mean that, there's, that they're not able to move away as quickly, right? So we're not sure. We're just guessing because a lot could have happened in the time since the light was emitted and made it to us. Okay, so we've also learned that we cannot see back in time before the beginning of the universe, right? Okay. All right, so now let's, um, let's move away a little bit from the, the big questions about the universe because that's going to be the topic of, of later chapters and talk a little bit more specifically about galaxies, namely galaxy evolution. All right, so here, looking back through time, we want to observe the life history of galaxies, right, and how we study their formation, okay? So if we look back, right, and we look back at distant galaxies, so those that are both very far away and thus very far back in time, we have a category of galaxies that are the ones that are further than 10 billion light years away, thus ones where we're looking at them greater than 10 billion years ago. So these are young galaxies. They're young galaxies because they represent some of the first galaxies that would have formed in the universe because the universe was young in this range of time from 13.8 billion to 10 billion years ago, the look back time, okay? And so, because we can see the universe in that case was only somewhere between approximately zero and short less than 4 billion years old. So these are young galaxies, okay? Now these young galaxies are basically irregular galaxies, okay? So they're kind of their own category, but they fall most, most in line with this group called irregular galaxies. And then as we look into kind of the modern galaxies, we see there are three types of galaxies that exist in the more modern era. That is the era that is after 4 billion years following the formation of the universe itself up to the current day of about 14 billion years. So that's look back time from zero, approximately zero, or maybe just a couple million years to the nearest galaxies, all the way back to a look back time of about 10 billion. So again, and now to get to those three types, they are elliptical galaxies, which are large galaxies that don't have a disk shape nor a, a, a lot of rotation, and they're formed of mostly older stars and they have a red color, okay? So ellipticals, they're elliptical because they're shaped like an ellipse, but a 3D ellipse, uh, hence the name, and they're red in color. Then you have spiral galaxies like our own Milky Way. Spiral galaxies have a lot of rotation. They, um, they tend to have star formation in the spiral arms, and they tend to have, um, at least have had active galactic centers at some point. So they have some interesting um, uh, characteristics. Irregulars are basically everything else that aren't spiral or elliptical. So deep observation, observations show us very distant galaxies as they were much earlier in time. Old light from young galaxies. I, lo I love this. I love that line. Old light from young galaxies. If you can understand that statement, then you understand a lot about what look back time means and what, you know, what it means to you know, have, have such great distances and have light travel at a fixed speed. Okay. So observing galaxies at different distances shows us how they age. Okay. And then we can speculate on galaxy formation, when, especially when we look at the, the matter between galaxies. And it appears that early in time, the gas in a cube like this one here um, was almost uniformly distributed, but then it started to collapse into pockets. So gravity draws gas into denser regions. And then over time, that those denser regions form protogalactic clouds that then start to form um, the galaxies. So essentially, this cube here represents a big chunk of the universe and all these little yellow dots are individual galaxies, some being big clusters of galaxies. And we see examples of galaxies that formed as huge clusters. This is a lot of the same physics, a lot of the same idea as star formation. It's just on a much larger scale, right? Big clouds collapsing in and forming something denser, hotter, much more energetic, okay? So we still can't directly observe the earliest galaxies, they're just too far away. But our best models for galaxy formation assume that matter originally filled all space of almost, uniform, almost uniformly and gravity of the denser regions pulled in surrounding matter. The denser regions contracted, forming protogalactic clouds. Right? This, is, this is very much like a nebula forming stars. The hydrogen and helium gas in these clouds formed the very first stars. Okay? And as we talked about with our own Milky Way, 
those first stars then would form the halo if it's a spiral galaxy, and then further collapse and would actually form the galactic disk. But then those halo stars are left over because they kind of form maybe too soon before the gas was able to collapse and really form into the disk. All right, so supernova explosions from the first stars kept much of the gas from forming stars. Leftover gas settled into a spinning disk due to conservation of angular momentum. So most of our models of, of galaxy formation are better explained in terms of forming an actual spiral galaxy. That's the one that is most consistent with conservation of angular momentum. Um, so it begs the question, how do ellipticals form? Well, perhaps they primarily form from spiral galaxies crashing together. So they really might be the byproduct of ellipticals, essentially, the, um, excuse me, of spiral galaxies dying. So elliptical galaxies are formed after spiral galaxies. They also could just be formed in, in maybe a, a region with very little initial rotation. Okay. So, um, but why do some galaxies end up looking so different? Okay. That's a good question. So in summary, we have learned that deep observations of the universe show us the history of galaxies because we are seeing galaxies as they were at different ages, including the very youngest irregular ones. And our best models for galaxy formation assume that gravity made galaxies out of regions in the early universe that were entirely hydrogen and helium, nothing else, just hydrogen and helium. Those are the only elements. Everything started from that. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the Big Bang, that the Big Bang only produced two things, hydrogen and helium. Okay. All right. So now let's talk a bit about the life cycles of galaxies. So why do galaxies differ and how does the gas cycle through a galaxy? Okay, so this is a, a galaxy formation, right? So a dense protogalactic cloud um, might settle into um, uh, or may form its, um, its stars before it settles into a disk. So if it's so dense, maybe all the stars essentially form like halo stars form in a, um, a spiral galaxy. And so there never is really a chance to collapse into a, a, a disk. So that could definitely lead to elliptical galaxies. Now that said, again, a lot, of, a lot of astronomers now think that elliptical galaxies are also formed by really, if not primarily, at least very commonly by um, spiral galaxies crashing together. And that's just a testament to the idea that these theories change over the decades, okay? On the other hand, gas in a less dense protogalactic system starts, um, stars move more slowly and it settles into a disk. And this could also be one that had greater initial rotation, okay? Whereas maybe this one had very small initial rotation. Uh, why don't all galaxies have similar disks? Well, spin, okay? So elliptical galaxies they, they might have very little spin initially, but then um, the uh, spiral galaxies might have a just greater amount of initial rotation, okay? Density, elliptical galaxies come from dense protogalactic clouds that were able to cool and form stars for the gas settled into a disk, all right? And observations of some distance re distant red elliptical galaxies support the idea that most of their stars formed very early in the history of the universe. So essentially, there, there's some of these galaxies where all the stars are only the ones that are, that are going to be less than the mass of the sun, okay? So these are, you know, very, very small stars, sometimes as, as little as one-tenth the mass of the sun, that are incredibly stable and long-lived. And it's a whole galaxy of those stars because they're just, all the other ones already died, and this is just a stable galaxy of, of stars, you know, that's just very long-lived stars. It's a very different galaxy from our own, all right? And we must also consider the effects of collision, okay? So this is the idea of two spiral galaxies colliding together, this is an actual um, Hubble, Hubble image, okay? And collisions were much more likely early in time because the galaxies are close together. As far as galaxies being close together, it's actually so fascinating because we think about the distance between stars. Stars really never collide with each other. Stars can interact with each other when they're in a binary star system where two stars kind of form to orbiting each other. But the actual distances between systems is huge. And that's just due to the way the cl the, the the clouds collapse. They have to collapse in a way that takes a huge amount of matter over a vast amount of interstellar space to create a star, such a high density thing. Well, galaxies are not nearly as high density because they're formed of stars with great, those great distances between the stars, which means that although galaxies are a cohesive structure in themselves, they're much closer to each other than stars are. So the analogy that, that I like to think of is that stars are so far apart that the entire solar system, the planets up to Neptune of our, our, our solar system would fit in a park. Okay? And at that scale of considering our solar system at the scale of a, you know, a city park, the nearest star and its solar system would be a park across the United States. So we'd have one, say, in the city of San Francisco and one in the city of New York. And that would be the distance between those two parks with everything in between, that vast distance, just empty. Okay? Effectively empty, maybe just you know, some you know, low-density gas and some asteroids and comets. So that, that's such a huge, vast distance between stars. Galaxies, on the other hand, are only two or three galaxy lengths apart. So you consider a galaxy like our own, which, is two, which has a diameter of 200,000 light years. Well, the nearest galaxy is 2 million light years away. 
That means that we'd only have to stack nine more of our galaxies between us and Andromeda to get there. That's not very far. So then if we consider that you know, the, our galaxy being a city park, well, then the next galaxy would be a city park across town. So very, very different scale between the distances between galaxies as compared to the distance between stars. So even now, galactic collisions are more common than, than anything like star collisions. Okay? So many of the galaxies we see at great distances and early in time do look violently disturbed. Obviously, there was a, in those first 4 billion years where it meant galaxies were swirling around each other. All right? The collisions we observe um, nearby trigger bursts of star formation. All right, so very, very active star formation occurring at, at the kind of the collision point between the galaxies. Modeling such collisions on a computer shows that two spiral galaxies can merge into an elliptical. All right, see? All right, and shells of stars observed around um, some elliptical galaxies are probably the remains of past collisions. Fascinating stuff. Okay, collisions may explain why elliptical galaxies tend to be found where galaxies are closer together. Because if we look, we can see clusters of spiral galaxies. We're part of one. It's a, a cluster of about 12 galaxies, um, some dwarf galaxies and a few, a few large spiral galaxies, including the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, but, you know, that's, yeah, that's notable. That's an amazing thing to think of a, a cluster of galaxies, each, each with a, over 100 billion stars per galaxy. But when we look at, um, the, you know, billions of light years away, and we look at huge, huge clusters of galaxies, there are cluster, clusters of elliptical galaxies where there are tens of thousands of elliptical galaxies all crowded together in big, big tendrils. All right, and and that's just a huge amount of mass in one place, unfathomable amounts of mass, and they're re they're very close to each other. And each of those elliptical galaxies do have, if not a hundred billion, at least at least a few hundred million, um, or a couple billion stars per elliptical. Okay, so giant elliptical galaxies at the centers of clusters seem to have consumed a number of smaller galaxies. They get gravitationally pulled together, right? So how does gas cycle through galaxies, looking kind of within an individual galaxy? Some galaxies called starburst galaxies are producing new stars at a very high rate, as much as 100 times that of our galaxy. And so we think of this as kind of the juvenile phase of galaxies. When they're, when they're younger, they're able to produce stars at a much greater rate, and then they kind of they slow down and become more stable, still producing stars. Our galaxy primarily produces stars in the spiral arms and is continuing to do so. Matter still being you know, passed around and condensed together, producing short-lived stars. But you know, there, there's a phase where there's just lots and lots of star formation early on. All right, Intensity of the supernova explosions in starburst galaxies can drive galactic winds. It can actually create these huge like, bursts of matter that, that get pushed away from the galactic plane. And the intensity of the supernova explosions in starburst galaxies can drive galactic winds, pushing matter away. And this is looking at an X-ray. All right. And a galactic wind in a small galaxy can drive away most of its gas, almost tearing apart the galaxy. All right. So how do galaxies differ? Well, some of the differences between galaxies are right from the conditions that, that, um, in the protogalactic cloud that made them. And that, that is definitely part of the explanation between ellipticals versus um, spiral galaxies. Okay? That's a big explanation there. Some, some are more rotation, some are denser. Okay? Ones that have more rotation would tend to be spiral. Ones that are denser would tend to be elliptical. Collisions can also play a big role in, um, in how galaxies can form and become new galaxies. Um, and then we have the idea of a starburst, starburst galaxy, which I, I said you should think of as a juvenile galaxy when it's still so young that it's forming stars at an incredibly fast rate. All right, so now let's talk about supermassive black holes. We talked a little bit about the direct evidence we have of a supermassive black hole in our own galaxy. We don't have that same resolu resolution of evidence for other galaxies, but some of the other galaxies have even bigger black holes, so it, that tells its own story in itself, okay? So do supermassive black holes regulate gal galaxy evolution? So what is the evidence for a supermassive black hole at the center of galaxies? Well, if the, um, if the center of a galaxy is unusually bright, we call, that, we call that an active galactic nucleus, okay? And there's a term for it, which I always thought of as a, as a misleading term. It's quasar, okay? So a quasar is actually a galaxy. It is a type of galaxy, okay? And I, I really want to point that out and call attention to it because it's so, it's so tempting when you see the word quasar to think it's a type of star, right? Um, just the word kind of sounds like a star, quasar. Um, it kind of maybe sounds like it's something like a neutron star because neutron stars are called pulsars, right? That same ending, SARS, pulsar. But a pulsar is a star. A quasar is a galaxy. So it's, I really can't stress that enough. You've got to remember which, that pulsars are stars. They're, they're neutron stars, in fact, right? They're the dead leftover cores from giant stars that had a, a high-mass supernova. 
but quasars are actually a galaxy where the, the, the galaxy itself is kind of washed out by the bright core. So all we can really see is the shining bright core, which means it does look like a star. I probably, I, the name probably comes historically, I haven't confirmed this, but the name probably comes historically from st astronomers that thought they were a type of star because we they don't really have a structure because we can't see it because the center is so bright that it just washes out of the light and we just see one really bright spot. Um, now, they, we do think they're primarily our spiral galaxies that are quasars, but the thing that, that outshines everything else is that active galactic nucleus. Now, we have, you know, our nucleus is much brighter, the nucleus in the Milky Way galaxy is much brighter than the spiral arm, so, you know, it's normal to have a bright nucleus, but this is a nucleus that is so bright and is outputting so much energy that it is, it is very noteworthy, and that's a quasar, okay? So, the highly redshifted spectra, spectra of quasars indicate large distances, so they don't, they don't tend to be any of the galaxies that are nearby, which means they tend to be older galaxies. Well, let me get that straight, okay? So they tend to be galaxies that we're looking back further in time, which means they're actually younger galaxies in terms of when they were formed relative to the age of the universe. So in other words, these are more juvenile galaxies. So what might this tell us? They might tell us that galaxies, spiral galaxies, go through a phase when they're young, when they have an active galactic nucleus. They go through a phase when they're a quasar, and then they calm down as they get older, and they're no longer a quasar anymore, okay? So from brightness and distance, we find that the luminosities of some quasars are um, greater than 10 to the 12 times brighter than the sun, right? So a trillion times, 10 to the 12 is a trillion, a trillion times brighter than the sun. Variability shows us that all this energy comes from a region smaller than our solar system. Oh my gosh, how can you get a trillion times the power output of our sun in a region the size of our solar system? Well, there's really only one way for that to happen, all right? So first, first quick question. A quick thought question. What can you conclude from the fact that quasars usually have very large redshifts? All right, they are very distant. They were more common early in time, early in the history of the universe. Galaxy collisions might turn them on and nearby galaxies might hold dead quasars, right? Well, excellent, I really love this, right, as a thought question because these are all very good ways to interpret that information. All right, so orbital evidence um, suggests that um, the distance of gas orbiting the center of galaxies, like the, the quasar galaxy M87, indicate a black hole with a mass of two to three billion times the mass of the sun. So we have a supermassive uh, black hole at the center of our galaxy, but it's nowhere near that size, okay? So active galactic um, nuclei of galaxies have, or active galactic nucleus, I guess it tells you it's the galaxy, well, they have huge black holes, all right? So orbital evidence, the, uh, the, the spectacular match between model and data for the galaxy M106 suggests a black hole of a mass 36 million times that of the sun. And so, um, so that means that this energy must be coming from the black hole. Well, how so, right? Black holes don't release anything. How do they release energy? Well, it's the acceleration up to the event horizon that's creating the energy. So gravitational potential energy of matter falling into the black hole turns into kinetic energy. Right? Again, once that matter passes over the event horizon, its energy is forever lost to us. But as, it, as it's accelerating up to that event horizon, it is emitting a lot of energy. So friction in the accretion disk turns kinetic energy into heat. The heat produces thermal radiation, photons, and that, that means that we can convert matter using E equals mc squared. 10 to 40% of that matter is getting converted into pure radiation. That is one of the greatest um, you know, matter to energy conversions known in the universe that which is occurring in the accretion disk around supermassive black holes. Stars don't, don't c convert nearly that much matter to pure energy, not even close, okay? The only thing that would even, would even ever surpass that would be an actual like matter-antimatter engine, right? Where you could specifically taking, you know, say protons and antiprotons or electrons and, and positrons and crashing them together and then getting 100% of matter into energy. But that would then take, you know, you know, systematically creation, creating those antiparticles and putting them in, into, you know, space together. But in natural occurrences, that never happens. And so this is, the, this is the greatest mass to energy conversion known. So many nearby galaxies, perhaps, perhaps all of them, do have supermassive black holes at their centers. These black holes seem to be dormant, all right, um, and active, uh, dormant active galactic nuclei. All galaxies may have passed through this quasar-like stage earlier in time. Okay, so it's part of kind of growing up as a galaxy. All right, so do supermassive black holes regulate galaxy evolution? Well, the mass of the galaxy's central black hole is closely related to the mass of its bulge. Um, that's the center of the galaxy. It's called the galactic bulge. The development of the central black hole must be related to galaxy evolution. So it's, it seems to be part of how being a galaxy is having a supermassive black hole at the center. It's not an exotic thing. It's just part of, of being a galaxy. 
So radio galaxies contain active nuclei shooting out vast jets of plasma that emit radio waves coming from the electrons that move, move it near the speed of light. And I always like this idea that radio galaxies are these highly high energy quasar galaxies because when you usually think of radio waves, you actually think of very low energy. Because if we're thinking thermal radiation, radio waves would come from a very, very cold gas, some of the coldest gas in the universe, because radio waves are very long wave, like low energy photons. But there's another way to make a radio wave, and that's to accelerate an electron so fast that essentially that accelerated electron is acting like an antenna, and then you're actually um, creating a radio wave from linear acceleration of an electron. And that's so different than the way that we produce radio waves, because we actually bounce electrons up and down in an antenna that's just a few meters or centimeters long. And so it's that, that rapid bouncing back and forth of the electron going back and forth. You see, if you can see my finger, my finger's going back and forth really fast. And so that, that, that bouncing back and forth then creates the radio wave. But that means that, of course, it bounces back and forth, and it's ricocheting back off either end of the antenna, the metal antenna. But what if you were to you know, accelerate something in a straight line? Well, that'd be really difficult because that means the electron would move very far in a very short amount of time if it was to accelerate quick enough. But that's what happens when you have so much energy. And supernovas do it sometimes. They can emit radio waves due to uh, electrons moving at the speed of light, and so can active galactic nuclei. All right? So the lobes of the radio galaxies can extend over hundreds of thousands of light year matter getting pushed out into the the, the space between galaxies. Okay, so that's that's what these these lobes that's where these lobes would be um, would be located in intergalactic space, the vast distances between galaxies. Again, only a few gal you know gal galaxy diameters and long, but still hundreds of millions of light years in distance. So an active galactic nucleus can shoot out blobs, right? Technical term of plasma moving at nearly the speed of light. This suggests a profound influence on the hot gas surrounding a galaxy. All right, here are the lobes of the radio galaxy. Uh, 1265 that are swept back upwards because of the motion of the galaxy through intergalactic um, through the intergalactic gas because there there is some gas which means there, there's going to be collisions between the matter that's being pushed off the galaxy and the galaxy itself is denser and is moving through space but the low density lobes are getting pushed back because they're colliding with the the very low density intergalactic um, gas the matter that exists between galaxies all right so what is the evidence for supermassive black holes? The active um, galactic nuclei are very bright objects seen in the centers of some galaxies and the be are best explained as material falling into supermassive black holes. Right? So it's indirect evidence, but it definitely just suggests that there is something there that's eating at matter. Orbits of stars and gas near galactic centers also strongly suggest black holes. Absolutely. The, um, the activity of supermassive black holes regulates the galaxy's gas supply. And there we have it our conclusion of our lecture on galaxies. And we'll be talking more about the big questions of the universe in the next few chapters. Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now.